Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful for my time here with you here uh, this morning. In my nearly 30 years at General Motors, I've never seen a more disruptive time in transportation, not even close. We're here focusing on the challenges and opportunities of urbanization, and with good reason. It's stunning to me that there are 20% more people living in cities today than when I was born, and the rate of increase is only going to continue. Underlying demographic trends require new mobility solutions and options for, on the one hand, millennials who are at least deferring ownership, to, on the other hand, aging consumers who are striving to maintain their independence. There's growing activism in policymaking way beyond just simple uh, vehicle emissions and, and uh, uh, safety standards. New measures like congestion charging and license quotas are taking direct aim at congestion in cities, both parking and traffic congestion. And we're in the midst of an extraordinary blast of technology that without question is going to revolutionize the transportation space. This is clear in the changing nature of partnerships and competition, including intense involvement from non-traditional competitors and, and partners from Apple to Lyft to Zipcar. So General Motors is naturally exploring some new directions and with a twist. More on capturing share of miles traveled than simply vehicles sold. So we have some very interesting new uh, projects that we're working on, like, for example, on Google's Mountain View campus, where we launched a Spark electric vehicle and a very innovative commuter ride-sharing program using data, analytics, telematics, telecommunications to create a real-time responsive ride-sharing platform to reduce parking and traffic congestion around their campus. It was a convenient system of door-to-door -door service for, for Google employees. Campus and urban environments with more stop-and-go, low speed, shorter distance trips are perfect applications for electric vehicles, especially when they're deployed in vehicle and ride sharing systems. On the product side, it's natural that we're working on first last mile concepts, even bikes and electric bikes. Bikes and bike infrastructures in cities are exploding. With General Motors' strong capabilities in automotive product development, electrification and connectivity, we see terrific opportunities to redefine mobility. Surprising some, we just launched a bike sharing program on our large uh, product development campus in uh, Michigan. Aggressively working on new transportation systems and conducting trials like the commuter ride sharing pilot with Google and focusing on city focused product concepts like electric bikes is natural for General Motors. And it's very consistent with our long history as a transportation innovator. But to fully realize and impact opportunities, collaboration among a new range of constituencies is required like never before. We're working with companies like Arup. And here in LA, for example, we've spent a lot of time with transportation leaders like Art Leahy, the CEO of Metro, and with California Transportation Commission members like Lucy Dunn and others. The urban mobility future requires that we envision and integrate products and services for congested, multimodal environments. This requires that we take into account a broad range of perspectives and expertise. And that requirement makes events like this very powerful for us, enabling, enabling an exchange of ideas to be vetted, improved, accommodated, and combined. Thanks very much. Please welcome to the stage Steve Clemens, Jeanette Sadek Khan, Donald Shoup, and John Zimmer. Greetings, everyone. That sounded enthusiastic. You can have <laughs> more. Uh, we're, we're with some awesome people here. Um, first, to my left, Jeanette Sadek Khan uh, is it you know formally uh, basically ran the uh, uh, was the head of transportation in the city of New York. We're going to talk about it in a moment. She's gone from being the most hated person in New York to the most loved, but we'll get to that in a moment. And we have Donald Shoup, who's chair of the Department of Urban Planning and director of the Institute for Transportation Studies at UCLA. And we have John Zimmer, who's co-founder and president of Lyft. And I should also mention that Jeanette is now with Bloomberg Associates uh, and helping to take these best and promising practices 
in urban management uh, out to many other cities. Right. But let's start with you, Jeanette, because um, you've got a great last name, Sada <laughs> Khan, we were just having great fun with it. But when you, you started, you know, when you look back and look at the impact of what you did in everything from creating bike lanes and city bikes to you know, new pedestrian pathways down through some of the most traveled by autos uh, uh, corridors of New York, uh, and all of this was going on, you, you had some of the greatest hate mail of all time in New York City. I did. Yeah. I did. Um, but as anybody that tries new ideas knows, you know, when you push the status quo, when you change things, uh, it pushes back. Uh, so that really wasn't a surprise. And actually, you know, Mayor Bloomberg was a big believer in trying new ideas. And he didn't really care if there was negative press that was associated with it. In fact, he used to say that your job security was greater the more you were under attack by the papers. So I had a lot of job security, um, which was fabulous. But I think that the, the piece was... You had the New York Post say... Uh uh, how angry they were with you, and Mike, Mike would say, good job? Yeah, well, it, was, it, it was, certainly was a long process, but I think one of the things that was really interesting was that the people were really ahead of the press and the politicians mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Uh, New Yorkers, like you know, citizens in, in cities around the world, are really hungry for change. You know, they want uh, to have streets that are safer. They want different options to get around. Uh, and, and when you show them if there's a, the possibilities on their streets, you know, then they really get behind it. So there wasn't a vocabulary for bike share, for traffic calming, for bus lanes and, and bike lanes. And you know, seven years later, uh, we have a whole new vocabulary and the potential on New York City streets is different. So we retrofitted these cities, the city with new software uh, different ways of organizing our streets, and we also sort of retrofitted the legacy hardware, reallocating the space on our streets, you know, more space for pedestrians, more space for people to bike, more space for people to have fast buses. And I think the thing that was really a surprise to a lot of people was how quickly we were able to make these changes. And I think New Yorkers, like uh, people in many cities, are, are, don't believe you can actually change things. Right. Well, so, I wouldn't have thought you, you, you could. I mean, you've really transformed the urban ecology. I, I go to New York a lot, and I just love walking down that strip uh, on, I guess it's 7th Avenue or Broadway uh, uh, from the park on down to Times Square. And I just wouldn't have thought it was possible. And we saw, so you, you've said that you like to experiment and, and to do this right, that you have this theory that you've got to go out and kind of blow it a few times. What were your worst failures? Um, well... I think that there was not really one big failure as much as there was, you know, we tweaked every single project. There was not a single project that we put down that didn't change. And um, we learned a lot along the way. And I think it was, you know, it's interesting, it was a very counterintuitive um, uh, series of changes that we brought to the city. So closing Times Square to cars and closing, you know, narrowing Broadway and yet making it work better for traffic seemed to be a counterintuitive thing. So to be able to demonstrate that, show that, pilot it, because, you know, people are, are anxious about change. You know, everybody is. The notion that you're here from the government and you're going to make, you know, things better, <laughs> just trust us, uh -huh. uh, sometimes is not as effective as saying, why don't we try this and see if it works? And if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the way that it was. And if it does work, um, we'll keep it. And I worked for a data-driven mayor. Mm. Um, I think his line is, you know, believe in God and everybody else bring data. Uh, <laughs> so we brought lots of data and um, we were able to demonstrate uh, to people that the projects actually worked. And at the end of the day, it went from beyond anecdote, you know, like, what do you as the cab driver in New York City think, to analysis, you mm. know, here was how the projects performed. And I think that went a long way to changing both the press coverage and I think the um, conception that people have in New York about what their streets can be and what their expectations are for their I city. Want to, I want to move to Donald and John, but just, just, um, one last question. When you think about this, there's a little bit of a tension in, in the title of our program, Wheels of Change, What's Driving the Future of Ur Urban Mobility, in the sense that it raises the question that we're thinking of fewer tires or at least fewer car tires or, or raising this broad question. Do you, do you think it's possible in what you've done that you're able to partner with the automobile, partner with 
other, uh, both traditional transportation systems as well as bringing in non-traditional. I like this line you had about the city bikes being the first new transportation network in New York in 75 years. Yes. Cool line. Well, it's, it's all about options. You know, it's not anti-car. It's, it's bringing better balance to our streets. When you think about it, our streets literally have not changed in 50 years. And if you were in business, you would not still be in business if you hadn't changed in 50 years. So we're really updating to reflect the new demands on our streets. And, you know, as you know, half the world now lives in cities. That's going to grow. We're in a global economy. The quality of life and the convenience and the lifestyle in our cities are key to the economic success of these cities. And you're seeing a lot of demographic changes and marketplace changes. So people want different things. You know, Americans are driving less. There's, you know, uh, it's the lowest level of number of miles traveled in 20 years. Americans, 30% um, fewer you car just, sales. You, I mean, you, Bicycling Magazine just called New York the number one best biking city. That's remarkable. No, Did you bribe great? them? You didn't bribe them. <laughs> no, we built... Were you there for the award? Um, well, Mayor de Blasio uh, and... Mayor, uh, Mayor de Blasio took credit for your work. Um, it, it, that happens when, when administrations change. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's wonderful to see that the work continues. We built 400 miles of bike lanes. We launched the, war, the largest bike share system in North America. Um, we put out thousands of bike racks. I mean, there's a reason why we were number one. I mean, I also work for a data-driven guy, so I like being number one. <laughs> um, but it was, it, there was a sea change, and I think it's, it's really interesting to see, and you're a New Yorker, and probably some of the people in this audience are, if you look at who's biking on the streets of New York, it's changed. You know, it used to be 20 years ago, it'd be the lycra-clad messenger with a sort mm -hmm. of, you know, bike chain strapped across, and now it looks like you, or you, or you, or me, black, white, old, young, you know, going to work, just having some fun. It's, it's completely changed, and as a result, our streets are safer than they've ever been in 100 years. And well, so this is all a package of improvements. It's, it's good for, for cities, it's good for the um, sustainability, it's good for your pocketbook. It's a triple bottom line win, and it's and it's. Well, it's a remarkable do. transformation. Donald, uh, Donald is at, at at UCLA. I guess if there was a Nobel Prize in parking economics, you <laughs> win. You know, he's the most famous parking. I mean, do you dream about parking challenges, uh, riddles, the <laughs> Rubik's cube? Of I mean, it's remarkable. The data shows that about 30 percent of urban traffic traffic jams are caused by people circling in their cars. And, and, and I'd love to kind of get your snapshot on how every urban center can, can change for the better tomorrow. Well, I think getting uh, parking right is the, is the quickest way to uh, improve a city. Uh, that, uh, you're right, a lot of cars uh, driving in our city centers are not going anywhere. They've already arrived and they're hunting for a place to park. Uh, so that's driving they don't want to do. This is unwanted vehicle miles traveled. So uh, the, the, the suggestion I've made uh, is to, for, for cities, it sounds very simple, and it turns out to be true, is to get the price of on-the-street parking right. Well, who could object to the right price for parking? Um, but by right price, I mean the, the lowest price the city could charge is still have one or two open spaces on every block. So wherever you go, you see, if you're driving, you see exactly what you want to see, a, a space waiting for you. Some people think they have great parking karma that they're born with, that there's a, a space available for them when they get there. <laughs> and given the laws of probability, some people will have... We call it rubbing the belly of the parking god. <laughs> That's right. But I think getting the right price for curb parking would give everybody great parking karma. And there wouldn't be these cars driving around, cursing traffic, staring at taillights, and hoping to find a free parking space. Because even in, even in Manhattan, most of the on-street parking is free. Uh, I mean, Donald, when I'm really looking for a parking space, I'm, I'm willing to spend nearly any amount to get the parking space. But it makes me think that someone out there can't afford that parking space, can have other reasons. So, you know, just like whether digital divides and health divides, are you going to create a parking divide between those who have and can afford to pay that market rate and those who can't but still have to go, you know, drop off their kids at, at, at uh, something or pick up a, a prescription somewhere? So what do you do 
you know, with, with the downsides of, of your parking formula? Well, where you live, the big divide is between people who own cars and people who don't own cars. And I think the people who don't own cars are the ones who get the short end of that deal. Uh, so I don't think we have to worry in Manhattan so much about the people who, who own cars and want to park them free. Uh, I think some people who don't want to pay for parking push poor people out in front of them like human shields, saying, don't charge for parking, it'll hurt poor people. Well, the real concern is that they, they don't want to pay for parking themselves. But to, 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 for the political software to make this idea uh, uh, popular and it's uh, picking up in the United States is for the city to uh, dedicate the meter revenue to pay for added public services on the metered blocks. So if, you're, if you agree to have meters in your neighborhood or paid parking, because uh, it isn't always by meters, it's by permits, is that your neighborhood gets uh, uh, sidewalk repairs, your neighborhood gets wires put underground, your neighborhood gets uh, additional street cleaning. Say in some cities in, in Southern California where they've tried this, the meters pay for uh, pressure washing the sidewalks twice a, twice a month, cleaning them every night, removing graffiti every night. So when the neighbors see that their meter money at work, these, these, these uh, uh, issues that it's not going to be fair, it's going to be difficult, melt away because whenever they step out their front door or out of their uh, business door, they see a transformation. They've, uh, in Pasadena, they completely rebuilt all the sidewalks, put in historic street lighting and street furniture, and the meters say, um, I think, uh, turning small change into big changes. So I think that, especially in dense areas like New York, where maybe 5% of the people on a block may own a car, and 95% suffer dirty sidewalks and dead street trees. If you change that to paid parking, you would see that the 5% would be paying for parking. They would be guaranteed a and space. you have confidence that the money would go in the right place? Because I've read something you wrote where you really slammed the city of LA for essentially dereliction of duty and taking money from the federal government to redo their sidewalks, uh -huh. and that, that they took money that they didn't deploy. Am I, am I on That's right. right. We, have, we have a comparison of the city of L.A. with a lot of broken sidewalks and the city of Pasadena, which has great sidewalks, because in Pasadena they have two good policies. One, they use meter, they dedicate the meter revenue to the meter neighbors. It's in the legislation. Mm. So you can't, in L.A., they suck the money into the general fund, as in New York City. It's, it yeah. just disappears into a black hole. Uh, the only way to make parking meters popular is to show people that this money is helping your neighborhood. So I think the surest way uh, to, to make something sustainable is to make it profitable. And if the neighborhood uh, sees the profits from these meters at work every day, the uh, beautiful public uh, services, then they will get on board with it. Uh, so I think that... Um, uh, that th these objections will melt away. And, and I think getting back to what J Janet said, if it doesn't work, you can always quit. See, I think that when you go to doctors now, at least at my age, <laughs> the good ones recommend physical therapy before drugs or surgical intervention. I think we should uh, uh, urge price therapy in mm. a city. You should, that's the simplest, cheapest thing to do, and it's reversible. So, uh, and other cities are doing it. I think that's the only real uh, uh, evidence that it works, is that people have tried it and they like it. If, if you were to imagine in, in the world of Donald Shoup, sort of cities that were the, gonna get the Parking Economics Champion Award, which city in the world do you think does it best? Well, I think London does a very good job, and Amsterdam, definitely, and now San Francisco. I think uh, uh, it's nice to see um, um, technology advances happening and being adopted in the United States, and it is now happening in San Francisco, where they um, have a project called SF Park, and uh, they set... Uh, uh, it's data-driven, and it's, the city council sets a policy. We want to see one or two open spaces on every block. And it's up to the administrators to adjust prices to achieve that result. They have different prices at different times of day, up 
from open until noon and noon to three and three afterwards because there are different demand. Where there's high demand, there's high prices, and low demand, there's low prices. And it changes from block to block. Uh, and they change the, the, the schedule prices once a month. Uh, and most people don't even know what's happening. They, 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 it, it, they just are happy to find a parking space, and they don't know that the price was different a month ago. They can see that it would be cheaper in the morning, but the thing that amazed me, and I think everybody else, is that the average price of parking in San Francisco went down during this project because mm. so many meters had been overpriced in the morning. You shouldn't have the same price all day long if the if demand varies all day long. So I think 17% of all the prices went down to 25 cents an hour. And the same thing is happening in LA. We have a similar project in LA called uh, Express Park, and much to everybody's surprise that the, uh, um, the average price of parking went down by 17%. Where can I go and park and try that out? Anywhere on down, as you're walking to the Olympic Theater tonight, you look at the parking meters and you'll see different prices at different times of day and on different blocks. And it's working? Uh, so yes, I think so. It's working, especially because there's no political backlash. Most people, as I said, don't know that it's happening. Uh, but the, the best thing for, for, for city council members is they don't have to make decisions on the price of parking. The, 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 the role of a city council should be to make policy, not to set prices at every single parking meter. And that's the way it is in LA. If you want to change the price of parking outside of downtown, it has to go to city council, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I think the city council ought to set what it wants to see and then uh, let, let the um, uh, uh, data drive the prices. So we have it, two urban ecology disruptors. John, uh, tell us about what you launched as an entrepreneur after launching something in Zimbabwe. We're going to connect Zimbabwe to this. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, my co-founder, Logan, was in Zimbabwe uh, and saw people, uh, which is true in many developing countries, sharing rides out of necessity. Um, and he was on a transit board in uh, Santa Barbara mm -hmm. and saw that they couldn't increase the number of bus lines because uh, the fare box recovery ratio, or what you pay uh, to get on a bus, typically covers only about 30% of the operating costs. And so when he saw people needing more buses, but no funding vehicle to get more buses, and then he saw uh, you know, third world poverty and uh, a better transit system, uh, he was inspired to, to create this platform. For me personally, I was so actually- The platform for everyone is Lyft, L-Y-F-T. I just downloaded it to my phone nice. to, 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 to try it out. I haven't yet. So I, I really get my first ride for free? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and you're announcing something big today for Los Angeles that, that just popped up on my screen. Yeah. So today in LA, we're bringing our Lyft line product, uh, which we have now in San Francisco, and it's a shared ride. So what we found uh, when we were looking at the data is that uh, in San Francisco, 90% of the rides had someone else going the same way as you within five minutes. Um, and kind of the, the long-term vision of what we're doing is that every car... So is that a private car or is that a, that's a, that's a commercial car out there that, that two people are coming along and getting? This is someone's personal vehicle. I see. So, uh, so when if my driver... chairman David Bradley was going to go to Santa Monica Beach and he could say, I'm going here... And, and I, could, I could join him, right? Is it, so that, what, that's the, that's the long-term vision. Right, right now, we have individuals using their personal vehicles when they have extra time. Um, and and long-term, and if we go back to kind of the roots of our original company, Zimride, where Lyft was born out of, uh, the, the whole idea has been, let's get every car, every personal vehicle uh, on the road. So David, if the Atlantic doesn't work out, the, this car thing might, might be useful you know, for your extra hours. When he's, he's got a nice car. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you're putting all these other cars to use in, in the world, but, but what is your, you, Travis Kalanick, uh, the CEO of Uber, spoke at an Atlantic Forum last year. Is he, are you his up at night issue? Is he worrying what Lyft is doing each day? And is he your up at night issue? Uh, I can't speak for him, but I can say that when, when we think about our competition, you know, the story has been uh, Lyft is competing with taxis, has been competing with Uber, and, and the way we think about it is that we're really competing with people driving alone in their cars and, and car ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, that- General Motors just must love you. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, we've had many car companies come and, and approach us and, and, and vice versa about how we can work together. Obviously, we need uh, these vehicles. These vehicles are gonna be around for a long mm -hmm. time, uh, but we can use them uh, much more efficiently. The average, I've heard the average car occupancy in LA is 1.1. 1 .1. 
Um, and I think we could all, you know, just look around in the, in the seats when we're driving in LA and, and see that to be The true. average car is 1.1. And, and, and what, what, you, what would you one, have to get it up to to really make a dent in traffic? I think it's about 1.3. I think you would eliminate traffic in LA. Wow. Yeah. So uh, what we're trying to do is make parking less necessary to make uh, traffic go away um, by, by opening up all those empty seats. Across the US, it's about 80% of seats at all times are empty on our roads. So when you're in a city like Los Angeles, I was just looking here and I saw the lift cars right around Olympic you know, Boulevard and, yeah. and around. How many actual drivers and cars or members or, or uh, advocates do you have to have in a city to, to dent it? And, and, and how far are you into that right now in, say, the city of Los Angeles? So it's, I'd say it's thousands. Um, and across the country, we have, we have close to 100,000 uh, cars on the platform. Hmm. And we're in 70 cities. Wow. And when you look at the, 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 I guess, the synergies and the efficiencies that you're getting, and say you combine it with a, you know, a smarter pay system here, and you've got an urban uh, ecology. I mean, I don't know if you've walked down Broadway in New York, but I mean, it's remarkable what you've done. And I ride the bikes just for the fun of doing it in New York now. Um, do you think, I mean, what is it when you sort of leap ahead five years from now, as opposed to what we're all kind of remarking at today, what should it all look like? What would a healthy, a really healthy transportation system look like? Yeah, so it's, it's what, you know, I'm going to say it's about lift line. It's about the idea that you, you go out of your house, um, you tap a button, and someone from your neighborhood that you might already know or that you have something in common with uh, is driving by and, and going to somewhere uh, within walking distance of where you're going. And the, the system uh, intelligently routes them to your doorstep uh, and, and drops you off uh, at, at your doorstep, and then they take it the rest of the way to, to their office. Um, so it's this community ride where everyone in our neighborhood uh, is, is opening up those seats. Now, with all the kind of cool, wonderful things we're having, Jeanette, I was just reading in, the, in New York that the, that the workers of City Bike have just unionized, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is really interesting. I didn't know, didn't know that. I have no idea what they make, but I saw the, the level. And it, and it seems that while you're seeing lots of new nifty gadgets and connectivity, mm -hmm. nonetheless, the prices are being driven down. Are we driving prices so far down that, that it's undermining the kind of social contract we should have with those workers. If you go further and further down the scale from say where taxis or Uber may be and you've got people out there on their own time, how does it add up into uh, a kind of a healthy life at, yeah. at reasonable wages? Well, I think there's, there's two sides to the marketplace. So there's drivers and passengers. On the driver's side, uh, you know, we think that's you know, the most important part, it's the lifeblood of, of the community. It's what, uh, it's, the, it's those individuals that provide service to the passengers um, and it's a competitive environment. And so when you have a competitor uh, that lowers prices in order to make sure that this platform and the drivers on this platform continue to get uh, more and more passengers, um, you have to look at, at matching, uh, matching those prices. Um, but also the, the, the big vision is to create affordable transportation so that individuals can have a higher quality of life. Those that don't own a vehicle um, can get around, can get to their job uh, in the same way that someone that does own a vehicle. So with both sides of the equation, I think um, as the price of transportation goes down, uh, you are helping a lot of people uh, who couldn't afford transportation like this before to get where they need to go. Jeanette? Well, I think there <clears throat> needs to be, you know, Lots of things have changed in cities. Um, you, you see lots of innovation happening in the healthcare industry, nanotechnology, lots of things. And, you know, cities have a very traditional transportation model. <laughs> a lot of things, nothing's really changed. We're sort of in the stone age in a way in terms of uh, the tools that we have. And so I think that um, the shared economy and transportation is a really exciting uh, opportunity for cities and re-looking at our assets differently. You know, the whole concept of car ownership is changed, and I think the idea that you know younger people really don't want to own a car. You know, they don't want the burden of having a car. They would much prefer to car share and to you know to time share and look at mm -hmm. you know using assets a little differently, which is a strength of cities because we've got the density and this, the the um, uh, infrastructure to be able to to manage that. But I do think that um, you need to have a different contract um, with these kinds of new. Uh, technologies. And so if you're going to build on the back of an existing infrastructure, you have to 
uh, adapt and there needs to be a new contract put in place. And so, you know, we were just talking before the session about how, you know, setting up maybe a kind of quick model, you know, a test bed, a new constitution for, you know, the streets or um, for ride share to sort of look at it a little differently to ensure that it's just not this race to the bottom. You know, in terms of so wages. you fear a race to the bottom. Well, I think it's an issue that that needs to be worked through. I mean, you don't want to close down the new technologies. You want to keep these innovations happening, but you also want to be mindful about balancing it. I mean, the shared economy is not going to go away, right? Um, it is hard, but it's not going away. I mean, it's not going to be. A, you can't just say like, you know, I'm going to delete the shared economy. Like you could delete, uh, you know, the YouTube album on your iPhone. You know, I hate that. You know, but. You, you hate the album or deleting the album? I hate that it was forced on me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so you... you, you That's a tweetable line. <laughs> <laughs> but it is... So we have to look at it differently, and we need to, I think, embrace this innovation, and it's exciting time. But again, we have to take a look at the roles and the responsibilities and make sure that we're, you know, lifting all boats and not just pushing it all down. And it is important to provide choices. You know, people want choices in cities. You know, they want different ways of getting around. You know, people want options when they want them, how they want them. And, you know, we've talked through just the, new, the device you can have, you know, where the closest, you know, car is, where the closest bike is, where the closest train is. Um, Gabe Klein is working on, you know, rerouting buses so you can have, you know, an instant bus line. Mm. I mean, it's really exciting to see the kind of innovation about repurposing our existing assets. And I think that's the strength of cities. And I think that's the future of, of transportation is not only taking a look at what we're doing with us re retrofitting cities with new software, but also taking a look at what we need to do. It's not going to all be on an app. We need to sort of upgrade our legacy hardware and our streets to sort of match that and then have a kind of social contract that allows for that kind of innovation and also that kind of um, protection. I just thought of a great innovation, Donald. I thought, you know, maybe just instead of having variable parking meter rates, we can have variable parking ticket rates. Oh, well, that's yeah. already happening. So I'm sitting... You get variable parking tickets. So if I, if I overstay my meter and, and, well, and, and get a $55 ticket, uh, well, I think I might, what I, yeah. I've recommended, I think uh, LA is about to adopt, is that the, uh, uh, it, it, in some cities do it, that your first ticket in a year for an overtime meter is a warning. Hmm. The second one might be $25, the third one might be $50, or the fourth. What are the New York rates? More like $300? Well, you know? whatever <laughs> they should be, they should be graduated <laughs> because in most cities, a huge share of all tickets are uh, given to a small share of the cars. Mm -hmm. Many, there are some people who are really serial violators, they're the ones who should pay a lot. But I was thinking, getting back to the idea of whether it's fair to charge market rate prices for on-street parking, uh, that the more there are the options like Lyft, which will allow people to live with uh, no car or just one car, I think it makes it even more unfair to, to have cities where uh, parking is free for cars and housing is expensive for people. That really defines Manhattan. We have free parking for cars, expensive housing for people. I think it should be the other way around, but at mm -hmm. least you should charge the right price for curb parking and improve the public sphere with better street furniture or um, things that everybody can enjoy, that everybody can share. The, 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 the sidewalks are shared. I think you raise a really important point in terms of experimenting, too, with uh, different rates and different strategies. We experimented in New York with Smart Park, mm -hmm. Park Smart, and we had different rates at different times and, and uh, tried it out in different uh, boroughs. And it was interesting. It was a big success. So now neighborhoods are actually applying hmm. to have this variable pricing on, on their streets. And so, again, showing what can happen. And I think it's great to have the dedicated revenues to go for streetscape improvements when you can get that done. In our city, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways of, you know, bringing those same kind of benefits uh, to city streets. But again, trying it out and piloting, you know, it's a, well, it's that's, a great strategy. That, it can be, Lyft is hard to pilot. You had to have a huge investment to begin with, and you need a large network. With, with parking reform, you can do it in one block and see how it works. And did it require a huge investment to get going? Uh, it, did, it started in one city with uh, a, a decent sized investment, but we've raised over $300 million. And so to get to scale in, in cities across the country and, and eventually the world, uh, it does require Are you operating in any capital. global cities? Uh, currently just in the US. Only in the United States right yeah. now. 
Well, let me open up. We've got a few minutes. I'd, I'd particularly like to hear from anyone who's also doing very smart uh, urban ecology, urban transportation uh, innovations that aren't here. But let me open the floor. I can't really see out there, but uh, if anybody has any comments or thoughts or questions. Hello. Um, yeah. Over here in the dark corners. Yes, right here. Uh, Will Wright with the American Institute of Architects, and this is a question for John Zimmer. And have you heard from your drivers what type of policy changes in parking will be helpful? Because as more of us adopt to Uber and Lyft and Sidecar, more of us are not necessarily needing a parking spot, but those vehicles are still on the road and they might have two or three minutes between customers. You know, where do they go so that they don't have to continue circling the block and adding to the problem? The, the biggest, this is kind of funny, but the biggest request that, that we hear is that drivers often need to go to the bathroom. Um, uh -huh. And so maybe there's a big opportunity for uh, cafes or, or, or something that has, you know, wants uh, the drivers to stop there, um, grab a snack, um, take a break and, and use the facilities. Um, but uh, that's typically the biggest request we, we hear from drivers in terms of you know, where they'd want to take a break or, or park. Um, but, but typically, the amount of time between, between requests, depending on the city. In, in Los Angeles, there's uh, an incredible amount of supply, incredible amount of drivers. Um, but in some cities, uh, like San Francisco, uh, the supply and demand um, is, is very closely paired. Um, the, the amount of time between, between uh, ride, from ride to ride is, is very short. Just but a raise an interesting, do you have a, a, a battalion of lawyers going out to <laughs> sue? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. If you landed in Dulles Airport and you want to go and get an Uber or a Lyft, uh, there's clearly a war going on between the taxis that, that are assigned to the airport and these other groups. And I know none of the equities on either side. I just yeah. know that it's really hard. They can be fined $500 if they pick you up on one level versus sort of faking it on another level. Yeah. And, and, and is that something that you go out and, and sue to try to get a correction in favor of your drivers? Uh, we, we don't go out and sue, uh, but we, we, we go out and try to have a conversation with uh, you know, airport directors, uh, city managers, uh, mayors, to say, hey, this is a service. I guess instead of sue, I could say have a conversation. Yeah. With. yeah. No, but we haven't, we haven't gone out and, 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 and <laughs> sued anyone. Uh, Great. We have another comment or question out here. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Carlene Chow. Um, I live in Madrid, Spain, but uh, it's actually a question directed to Professor Shoup regarding, I find it interesting that you use Pasadena as an example, um, because Pasadena itself, uh, I, I, every time I, I come to LA every year and uh, I go to Pasadena because that's where my grandparents live. And uh, I've seen a huge, in the last 10 years, a huge uh, differentiation between Lake, the Lake Street and Old Town. And uh, Lake has really in, you know, fallen down in terms of commerce. You see empty storefronts everywhere. And everyone I know in Pasadena complains that it's because they've instituted street parking. And, uh, and basically, you know, the, the problem is competition as well, because if you go to Lake and you're trying to run errands and you have to pay street parking, or you can go to a mall where it's free, or you can go to even okay. Old Town where you can get an hour and a half free for, you know, and suddenly Lake, there's no free options. And, you know, you really drive down commerce in, in certain areas. So is your view of Pasadena too rosy? Not at all. Uh, it is the Rose City, anyway, the, uh, the, with the Rose Bowl. But it's, uh, Lake Avenue used to be the Fifth Avenue of, of uh, Pasadena. And uh, Colorado, Old Pasadena was a skid row. People thought Old Pasadena would never revive. There were empty buildings, and uh, uh, when they put in the meters, some people thought the meters would keep... Uh, uh, customers away, the few customers they have, but because they dedicated that revenue to greatly improving Old Pasadena, it has blossomed. The, the, the way you could tell is the sales tax revenue shot up. Hmm. It was the lowest sales tax revenue source in the city when the meters were put in, and within three years it had surpassed Lake Avenue in a way that nobody could have thought about, but because, as Janet said, that when a, when a uh, uh, part of town sees another part of town doing well, the other parts of Pasadena have asked for parking meters too. And, in, and on Lake Avenue, they said, we want that. It was, it was a humbling of a very proud 
uh, commercial district to say that, that they would be copying uh, all Pasadena. And, uh, cities like La Jolla, they bring people up on buses to look at old Pasadena. When it would have been inconceivable right. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Donald. Jeanette, just final word in the last one second. What is the most valuable thing you can convey to people that are trying to transform their cities? What, what is the lowest hanging fruit? When you came into New York and said nothing can be changed, what, where, where should someone with perhaps a more modest city think of starting? And we'll end there. <clears throat> well, I do think that streets are the most valuable uh, resource that a city has. And a lot of the opportunities are right there, but you look at them the same way you have for the last 50 years, like they've been in suspended animation. So if you take a look at different ways of repurposing your streets, could be just, you know, restriping them. It could be painting out a plaza. It could be really painting out a bike lane. It could be putting in some pop-up cafes. It doesn't take a lot of money, uh, and it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, it takes a little bit of political courage. But uh, I think at the end of the day, you'll see that people are really excited, excited about change, you know, change that they can see, change that they can touch, you know, it's much better than touching an engineering drawing or going through a computer modeling. So piloting it, trying it, seeing if it works, you know, you can, you can change the use of a space in real time. And when you think about it, a mayoral term is usually four years and most of the traditional construction methods to get something done are Long. five, six years. So to be able to change your city in real time and show changes uh, to citizens of your city um, p has a right. huge payoff. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Jeanette, I know you've gone uh, from these tough times of being attacked. If you go do a news search of Jeanette Sadiq Khan, she's the most revered woman in, I think, New York's history now. <laughs> the difference so, I mean, nine it's, months. It's, it's, it's been, yeah, difference <laughs> nine months. was remarkable. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Jeanette Sadiq Khan of Bloomberg Associates, Donald Shoup of UCLA, and John Zimmer of Lyft. Thank you very, very much.